fellow is the man rallying farmers rebels. He's going to give us a pointed uh, look at the unique problems that face companies trying to invent and develop new drugs. Go for it. Good morning, everybody. So for the next 40 minutes, we will talk about whether entrepreneurs can remake uh, drug R&D and can, re can remake the uh, industry. I would like to introduce uh, that uh, panel by asking the question that is at the center of the debate, and it is, does drug R&D really create value or not? And I would comment in passing that the chief executives of the industry are no longer speaking with a single voice on that one, with several of them having publicly disclosed that drug R&D has become an unwieldy enterprises that waste as much as 30 cents for every dollar that we invest in it. Now, why is this? Something is supposed to happen. Here we go. Uh, difficult to understand what is happening here without reminding everybody of uh, the now famous Earrooms Law, uh, which is Moore's Law spelled in reverse, which is a poorly understand, understood phenomenon that is crushing the industry. That phenomenon is responsible for having the number of new drugs that we are getting per billions of dollars invested in R&D. That phenomenon has been at work for the last six decades, and it has defeated every attempt to change it. However, recent evidence, and I will present it in a minute, suggests that or exculpates some of the uh, usual suspect. But that phenomenon is basically, uh, is basically created what I call Pharma's Triple Challenge. And Pharma's Triple Challenge is that we need more innovation, we need better innovation, and we need affordable innovation. And we need to tackle all three challenges successfully at the same time if we are to secure the future of the industry. Tackling one or two just isn't enough. So how do we do that? Uh, well, let me illustrate the magnitude of the problem uh, that we face uh, uh, so that uh, we, can, um, we, we, we can understand it in its full, um, in its full dimension. In the last... Uh, 10 years, the industry has spent $1.1 trillion on R&D. And for that, what do we get? We get a pipeline that is worth about $300 billion. Now, I don't know how you I mean, can reconcile those two figures, but I cannot. So clearly, there seems to have been some value destruction there. In fact, some CEOs tend to agree with that proposition. As you can see from the quote here, uh, Mr. Wiebacher at Sanofi uh, has been on record saying that big companies are not any good at doing innovation. They, dis they do everything to avoid any disruptive thinking. And there's no chance of coming up with disruptive innovation if you're unwilling to disrupt yourself in the first place. Whatever innovation we produce, is often just not good enough. In fact, oftentimes it is barely better than the generics that's already out there, which can be purchased for literally pennies. This curve reflects the percentage of prescription in the US market that have been filled, filled by generics over the last 10 years. And as you can see, that percentage has doubled in the last 10 years from 47% to about 80% last year. We're on track to eat 90% in a few years from now. So if the branded pharmaceutical industry only addresses 10% of the needs of Americans, is it becoming irrelevant? I mean, we are producing uh, increasingly and affordable drugs that uh, target uh, an increasingly smaller percentage of the population. 
Uh, there's some quotes here, and I, by the way, I don't mean to put anyone on the spot. Uh, I've got quotes for every company in the industry, and they all say the same message, that is, we've got a problem. Um, Mr. Sima, who's a professor at MIT, was a consultant at JNJ for five years. And he saw at JNJ what I saw at Lilly and what you can see in every pharmaceutical companies, and that is massive uh, destruction of good ideas by people who are frankly uh, not receptive uh, to those ideas. How do we change that? Can entrepreneurs do it? Uh, some, some, some CEOs think so. Uh, Mr. Schwann at Roche has been on record saying that uh, we've got to go away, to move away from marginal innovation. Marginal innovators will not survive. They either go bankrupt or they will be bought or consolidated. And in fact, we've seen some of that happening already. An affordable innovation, we've all heard about the $80,000 pill. Um, I think a model that pushes its customers into bankruptcy uh, is, um, is, is under challenge. Um, the reason for this unaffordable innovation, needless to say, is the extraordinary cost uh, that it takes uh, uh, to coming up with new drugs. Now, there is a lot of opacity around what it really costs to bring a new drug to market. But again, some CEOs have been helping us, mostly Mr. Witte and Mr. Wiebacher. And in a recent uh, report to the French government, Sanofi admitted that uh, its average cost per new drug is $7.1 billion, and that compares to um, $5.8 billion for the rest of the industry. He ought to know. Mr. Witte also commented that uh, the uh, official pharma estimate of $1.2 billion uh, is uh, uh, unacceptable, that's his word, unacceptable. And uh, it's just there in order to frame the debate in terms of IP, pricing, and access, and away from R&D productivity in a way, as he puts it, that no longer serves the interest of the industry, patient, or society. So how do we change this? Can we overcome the vice? Can we reverse those trends that are crushing the industry? Well, I told you that, uh, or, or you may have heard uh, uh, quite frequently, indeed, that uh, it's all FDA's fault. If FDA was not so zealous, uh, was just more understanding, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, very common statement just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Uh, you have here a couple of uh, uh, charts on the left side you have the uh, uh, number of big blaster drugs you know, in, the, uh, in the industry, and you have the number of phase three and phase four trial that have been sponsored uh, by uh, the company that have brought those drugs to market. And again, I don't mean to uh, bring uh, anyone on the spot because all companies are basically doing the same thing. But what you can see there is that uh, each company has basically uh, uh, done those very expensive phase three, dozens of them, sometimes over 100 of them, very expensive phase three trial in support of those drugs. Now, FDA only requires two trials, not 100, not even 50, not even 20. And most of those trials, by the way, were undertaken after those drugs were approved. So they were not really supporting the registration of the drug. Now, some of this is required by the need to broaden the label and make sure that all the patients who can benefit from the drug have access to it. But you can go to the internet and look at the uh, label for those drugs and uh, look at the claims that are listed <coughs> and just ask yourself what sort of clinical research activity is needed to register those claims, and it never adds to dozens of trial, let alone 200. So is this really research? Is this research that we need? The cost of this is, is enormous. And doesn't this, isn't this a, a contributor, a major contributor to uh, the unaffordability of, of research? On the right side, you have another chart which basically shows that in the US, as well as in Europe, half of the drugs that start phase three do not complete phase three for either lack of efficacy or safety. Half of them. 
and from the half that eventually reaches the regulators, 40% of that does not get approved for the same reasons. So if you combine the failure rate in phase three and submission, it's 70%. It's worse than phase two. Now why do we fail so much so late in clinical research? The cost of the failures, uh, needless to say, is enormous because by the time a product uh, uh, reaches phase three, a s significant amount of money have been invested uh, to bring them there. Uh, and it's difficult to escape the conclusion that mediocre drug candidates are really the source of the problem. Good drug candidates seldom fa fa fail in phase three. And why do we have mediocre drug candidates? Again, uh, some of the CEOs are helping us there, uh, having commented, Mr. Wiebacher in particular, that uh, this whole business of industrializing the research and coming up with so many uh, drugs in phase three and phase two and so forth in order to ensure a steady flow of, uh, of uh, innovation is basically forcing uh, into, uh, into the pipeline compound that should never have been there. So, uh, no, it's not FDA's fault. It is management fault, uh, management responsibility, or poor management decisions, oftentimes, that, is, that are driven, uh, driving, rather, uh, R&D cost, uh, and uh, that's one of the issues that needs greater attention that it has received. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard.